Well, good evening, and let me add my welcome to Paul's. It's great to see you. It's great to see some new faces, some new and returning faces also. Uh, if you've got a Bible, can I invite you to open up Matthew chapter 6. We are continuing our series through the Lord's Prayer, and we are reading verses 5 to 15. As you find that in your Bibles, why don't I pray for God's help? Lord, teach us how to pray. Please take us to the schoolroom of prayer as we consider the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Help us to know and love you more as we consider what it means when we pray, hallowed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Matthew 6, and starting at verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Amen. Last week, we began our summer evening series through the Lord's Prayer, and we considered what it means to pray to our Father in heaven. I loved being reminded that as a Christian, as a child of God, and as part of God's family, Praying to our Father means we can't earn his love, we can't lose his love, and we're not alone in enjoying the eternal love of the transcendent, supreme, sovereign, utterly beyond us God to whom we're praying to. This evening we're still at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer and we're considering the big question, what do we mean when we pray, hallowed be your name? What does it mean to hallow? And what is God's name? Or what is encompassed slash contained in God's name? These days, we hardly ever use the word hallow. And when it comes to thinking about God's name, well, it would take a lifetime of study and eternity to appreciate the depths of the riches of what we mean. That, however, isn't a cop-out. And so we will consider some of what we mean when we speak of God's name. We have two points this evening. Please don't be put off by however many bullet points are going to come up on the screen. Uh, our two points are very simple, and they follow the structure we had last week also. First, what is God's name? And second, what it means to hallow it. So firstly, God's name. As we begin, it's incredibly important, I think, to note the form of the sentence we are studying. In our over-familiarity with this prayer, we may be tempted to think of hallowed be your name as a statement of fact, um, a good and appropriate declaration that God's name is holy. However, rather than an acknowledgement of an existing truth, this is a petition. It's a request. Jesus taught the disciples to ask that God's name would be hallowed. I think this is pivotal for our understanding of this section and how Jesus is teaching us to pray. Jesus isn't saying, Father, your name is holy. Instead, he's saying, Father, please may your name be hallowed. 
In other words, Jesus is teaching us to ask God that his very name would be regarded as sacred, treated with reverence and seen as holy. Louis Burkhoff in his systematic uh, theology tome says of God's name, this stands for the whole manifestation of God in relation to his people. In other words, we might say God's name is everything he has revealed about himself as he relates to us. God's name embraces the full scope of his excellence, his majesty, his holiness. And we obviously can't contain all of that in one sermon, but we can catch glimpses as we explore scripture. So let's explore scripture. We're going to be jumping about and looking at different verses in the Old and New Testament. So I trust the references in the handout and on the screen prove to be useful as you follow along or as you jump ahead in excited anticipation. So what does God's name mean? Well, firstly, God's name means he is. Will you turn with me to Exodus 3? And verse 14, this is the epic passage of God revealing his own name to Moses at the scene of the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. What we learn here is so fundamental about God's very nature, that he is Yahweh. God's name isn't an abstract idea, a mere identifier, but reveals to us that God is the God of living reality, of living presence. God is a personal being who is present with his people. I think it challenges our own limited capacities and imagination that God has always been, that he never hasn't been. He simply is from all eternity. And this massive idea is contained in his name as he introduces himself to his people. We're going to move swiftly through these points. And secondly, God's name means mercy and love. We're still in Exodus. So will you turn with me to chapter 34 and verses 6 to 7? Uh, Our next point is also in Exodus 34. So we're going to be there for a wee bit. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This morning we were considering God's steadfast love, his forever love, even in the most dire of circumstances. And here, When God came down a second time to Mount Sinai to speak to Moses, the first thing he did was declare his name. His name being synonymous with abounding love and mercy and grace. I've got a chunk missing in my notes, but that's okay. Because what we learn on Mount Sinai is what we know to be true in the New Testament also and in the person of Jesus. 1 John 4 tells us that God is love and that in this is love, that he sent the Lord Jesus to die for sinners as a propitiation for our sins, echoing the words of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. You know the rest. 
As a staff team, we have been reading over many months, uh, we read a couple of months ago, the book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. And the title is provocative, but really helpful, because one thing we've been learning is how vast the concept of God's love is, how vast and awesome it is. I wish we had more time to unpack that, but suffice to say, God's name means mercy and love. God's name also means that he is jealous. I'm especially um, intrigued, and I found this one really challenging. If you just follow down to verse 14 of Exodus 34, um, let's read together. Verse 14, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God, whose name is jealous. In my studying and surveying the mentions of God's name, I was really struck by this verse, partly because it never stuck with me the times I've read through Exodus, but also because of how clear and, and helpful it is. The first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. God's name reveals to us that he is jealous for our love and devotion, our enjoying of himself, and that he is rightly angered when our attention and our worship is directed to other stuff, to idols. This, of course, is a, a right jealousy, not one grounded in insecurity or lack of trust. When we think of jealousy, we probably think of a powerful human emotion that is shaped by resentment and can do a great deal of harm. Even in the Bible, Rachel is jealous of her sister Leah. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him because he was the favorite son. God's jealousy is not a sinful one. Rather, the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God totally committed to his honor and glory. Or as J.I. Packer helpfully put it, God's jealousy is a praiseworthy zeal on his part to protect something supremely precious. We will consider in a moment how God takes his name really seriously, but let's jump to consider that God's name also means he is holy. We turn with me to Isaiah 57. We're getting through the Old Testament together. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. God's name means he is holy. And this is what it says, verse 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. God is holy. I heard it once said that his holiness is the attribute of attributes. He is unlike any other. He, uh, he is above and separate from all that is common and ordinary because he has extraordinary value. Hillary, my wife and I were on holiday on Isla this past week and we visited one or two distilleries. And many whiskies are valued and priced on how rare they are. Likewise, with most collectibles, whether it's stamps or coins or Pokemon cards, they are valuable in direct proportion to how rare they are. The rarer the item, the more trouble we go to protect and care for them. Well, God is one of a kind. And he inhabits a place infinitely above our ordinary world. As I was thinking about God's name, meaning he is holy and so other, I couldn't help but think of the wonder of the gospel. That in Jesus, the God whose name is holy came near to dwell with sinners like us. God's name also means judgment, though, and there's two verses on the reference there, but we will limit ourselves to reading Revelation chapter 21 
and verse 6. This verse will be familiar to many of us, I'm sure. Revelation 21 and verse 6. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. When God tells us that he is Alpha and Omega, that his name is beginning and end, he teaches us something about himself and something about us. On the one hand, that every human, whoever you are, Christian or not, you had your beginning in God. And on the other hand, and crucially, we will all have our end in God. God is everyone's Alpha and Omega. We will all either receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom or sent to hell where darkness dwells. This is Second Peter language that is inevitably still in my head from our series not that, not, not that long ago. But if we were to use language of revelation itself, God's name means judgment and we will meet him as either fountain of life or as a lake of fire. I hope we're noticing how all-encompassing thus far God's name is. And almost finally, God's name is manifested in Jesus. Paul mentioned that as he opened up the service. And we're going to read John 17, verse 6. It was part of our earlier reading. John 17, verse 6 says this. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Christ supremely displays God's name. Jesus is the fullest manifestation of God's name. So if we're to answer the question, what is God's name? We ought to turn our gaze to Jesus. Jesus echoed God's very words, I am, when questioned by Pilate. Jesus was so loving and merciful that he went to the cross to die in the place of sinners. Jesus was jealous and zealous for his father's name to be upheld, that he kicked the traitors and money changers out of the temple. Jesus taught of judgment quite a lot not forgetting that he also taught of salvation also. That's why Romans 10 says, whomever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how Acts 4 says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. Our God is eternal. His name means love and mercy. He is sovereign, holy, jealous for our wholehearted devotion, and he is coming in judgment. That and so much more is his name. And as a point of, of application, God takes his precious and holy name incredibly seriously, and, and so should we. Helpfully, what Jesus taught the disciples in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer adds up with God's own view of the seriousness of his name. Right from the beginning in the Ten Commandments, God regulates and gives clear instruction and guidance on how we ought to use his name. Commandment number three says... You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not find him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God places a high premium on the importance of his people recognizing his name as holy and treating it as such. Likewise, Jesus, when he's teaching the disciples how to pray, treats God's name with the highest and utmost importance. In John 17 that we read earlier, we learn of the closeness, the relationship of God the Father and the Son as Jesus prays. Jesus loved the name of God and desired to make it known. 
Jesus also took God's name really seriously. How seriously do we take God's name, do you think? I wonder if you were to ask the average Christian what the top things we should ask God for in prayer are. What do you think they'd say? What about if we were to give them a top 10? Would the honoring of God's name make the top supplication spot? We'll come back to that in a moment. But if you can remember as far back as a year ago, I was introduced to the congregation by the service leader as John McPherson. The McPhersons. It's pronounced McPherson. It's, it's a little annoying when somebody doesn't get your name right or they misspell it or when somebody addresses you by a nickname of their choosing that they find hilarious but that drives you up the wall. If any of these are relatable at all, um, I'm sure that at the heart of the annoyance is people not taking us seriously. They don't have enough concern to even get your name right. Now, please don't misunderstand. I've since forgiven Phil for his very honest mistake. But you get the point, right? God isn't overly sensitive or capricious, as I can often be with how people say my name, but he does take his name incredibly seriously. Jesus took God's name seriously. God is zealous that we treat his name with reverence because it is so precious, and so should we. So let's dig a little deeper and consider what it means to hallow his very precious name. So our second point, hallowed. The word hallowed means to sanctify or to make holy. Now, of course, we know that God is already holy. So when we ask God to hallow his name, we're not asking him to, we're not asking to cause himself to become something he isn't already. Rather, what we're asking God is that he would cause his name to be treated as holy. I think we can get our heads around that idea. We teach our children in Sunday school that to be holy or hallowed is to be set apart, separate, distinct, other. God is unlike us. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He is unlike any other in every way. And we are asking God that he would show himself to be such in us, through us, and to all the earth. So how do we treat God's name as holy? Well, three points up there on the screen. Hallowing means believing God. Will you turn with me to Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12? Um, an instance of the Israelites grumbling in the wilderness. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Numbers chapter 20, verse 12 says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. In this specific occasion, the Israelites have no water, so they grumble. And Moses is instructed to strike a rock that will pour out water, but he does so resentfully or bitterly. How does God respond? Well, he says, you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy or to hallow me. In other words, to honor God's name, to hallow his name is to believe in him, to trust in him and what he says. Moses didn't have full confidence in God. He obeyed resentfully. And so Moses is described as doing the opposite of hallowing God. So when we pray for God's name to be hallowed, we pray that we and others would believe in God. We ask God to help us to trust in him and that others would trust in him and his words.
But secondly, hallowing means fearing God over man. And for this, returning to Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 12 to 13. Let me read for us. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. In this text, God is speaking to Isaiah and telling him to not be like his fellow Israelites who fear man rather than God. We honor God as holy. We hallow his name as we stop fearing the things of this world over the God whose name means sovereignty and holiness and judgment. And very practically speaking, we're praying that God would help us to take a stand for him in hostile situations when our reputation is at stake. May your name be hallowed as I learn to fear displeasing you, God, over the fear of displeasing a colleague or a family member who is offended by my faith. John Piper reworded this idea of this petition really helpfully when he said, it's as if we're asking, Father, cause people to have such a high view of you that it is a more dreadful thing to lose your approval than to lose anything the world can offer. And I think that's a really helpful rewording. And it reminds me of our sermon series in 2 Corinthians, when the Apostle Paul is so much more concerned with people's eternal standing before God than their temporary opinion of himself. Hallowing means fearing God over fearing whatever man may bring against us. One last one before we consider some applications and draw things together. Hallowing means following God's commandments. And for this, we're in Leviticus chapter 22. And if there's a typo on my script, it means that there's a typo there too. So let's have some fun with that. Leviticus chapter 22 from verse 31. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. This last side of what it means to hallow God's name is following his commandments. To not follow his commandments, we are told, is to profane his holy name, to blaspheme or to mistreat or misuse God's name. It's the polar opposite of hallowing. Therefore, to hallow God's name is to do the opposite. And when we pray, we ask God his com- for his commandments to be obeyed. I hope, therefore, that we can see that when we pray, hallowed be your name, we are asking God, cause your word to be believed. Cause your displeasure and judgment to be feared. Cause your commandments to be obeyed. Cause your name to be glorified. We can become part of the answer to this part of the Lord's prayer as we trust, revere, obey, and praise God. But as we draw the strands together and put both halves of this petition together, how are we to be challenged to pray this evening? Well, can I say this, and and it's a big one, and it'll have some um, distinct ramifications. I think what God is saying to us tonight through this passage is make God's priority your priority. Let us make God's priority our priority in prayer. In the overall order and, and structure of the Lord's prayer, God in his wisdom chose to put this petition first. Why? Because top of his priority list is that his name be hallowed. As the Lord teaches us how to pray, we must realign our ideas of prayer and our petition priorities with God's priorities. 
I actually did go to the trouble of asking a dozen or so friends, um, Christian friends, men and women, different ages and stages, what is the most important thing we ought to ask God for in prayer, do you think? Their answers were great. Some of them said, wisdom, patience, forgiveness, give me a heart that genuinely seeks after God. What David asks for in Psalm 27, one thing I asked of the Lord, to live in his house forever and behold his beauty. Others just said, to be more like Jesus. And all of their answers were encouraging and good. And it's a fun exercise if you're bored and you really want an edifying conversation. Send that text out, just copy and paste. But if I were to be a tad critical and self-critical also, I wonder if we often pray in the wrong manner. We should pray God-centrically. That's how Jesus taught us how to pray. However, it's really difficult. We are so concerned with our own situations, our own lives, perhaps with our own church or with our families, our country, that things tend to revolve around us in prayer. I'm hugely challenged by this petition. And I think the Lord Jesus is teaching us this. Whatever our petitions, whatever our situations When we pray, let's make God's top priority our top priority. What God desires first is the hallowing of his name. Our desire then should be that God would be believed, taken seriously, obeyed, and worshipped because of his glorious and all-encompassing name. We're asking God to cause his name to be treated rightly, People make up their minds about the God we claim to love and serve based on our witness, our visible fruit. Of course, we often are poor reflections of how amazing God's name is, but what a difference it would make to our witness, our church, our evangelism, if we were prepared for God to answer this prayer in our lives. On that, did you notice that this is a a corporate prayer Also, Ben drew this out helpfully uh, last week. So we're also praying that as a church, as God's family, God would show himself to be who he is amongst us. That God's holiness and love and mercy would be manifest in our midst as we display his character to each other and to world outside those doors. Finally, this is an evangelistic prayer. Since we are asking God that his name would be hallowed, we might ask the question, for whom am I praying? Or whose heart are we asking God to change when we pray, Father, cause their heart to believe you and fear you and obey you? We're not only praying this for ourselves, but for those who do not call on God as their father. We're asking God to show himself to be holy and savior to those who don't treasure his name as it should be. The next two petitions spell out a bit more clearly this idea of mission and evangelism in the Lord's prayer. However, the answer to our question, for whom am I praying this for, I think is quite clear. We're praying for ourselves, yes, but we're praying for every tribe and tongue and nation of the world. God's purpose is to be hallowed. That's his top priority, to be believed and feared and obeyed and glorified by his people in all people groups of the world. We might not be overseas missionaries, but there are those who don't know God as Father a lot closer to home as well. I think this is some of what God is teaching us in the Lord's Prayer. If we aim to be obedient to the Lord, we must seek to let this prayer be answered in our own lives. We must hallow his name more deeply We must believe and fear and obey his name with new intensity. 
We must be willing ourselves to go wherever he may lead us and share of his glorious name. So let's pray for God's help in that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Dear God, please help us to appreciate who you are, what your name means a little bit more each day. Help us to take your name seriously and help us to hallow your name, to praise and worship you by trusting you, fearing you, and obeying your commands. As we consider this prayer over the next few weeks, please help us to grow in our confidence, in our desire, and in our love for prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.